here this morning with Professor David Costell, Emeritus John and Janice Fisher, Professor of Exercise Science and Emeritus Director of the Human Performance Laboratory at Ball State University. Welcome back to Australia, Dave, and to the University of Melbourne. It's good to have you back here. It's good to be back and to see you. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering if you could share with us how you got into exercise science uh, from your early beginnings into moving to Ball State and establishing the very successful Human Performance Laboratory. Well, my background really was as a coach and uh, a biology teacher. And uh, it was a very easy combination of bringing the two together. So when I went to the University of, uh, at Ohio State to study for a PhD degree, uh, I suddenly realized that I could blend the two together. And as a consequence, uh, the first job that I took after I received my PhD was to uh, both coach and to start a laboratory in New York, upstate New York at Cortland. And after about two years, I realized that I really uh, enjoyed the, the relationship with the uh, athletes, uh, but I didn't like to do all the recruiting and, and negative parts of being a coach, but I really loved doing research. So at that point, I decided it was time to find a place where I could start my own laboratory. And that's when I moved to Ball State. And of course, at that time, in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, there was a very much a running boom starting yeah. in, the, in, yeah. in, in the US. And, and really, you were the first to introduce the muscle biopsy technique to study the, the characteristics of some of these endurance athletes, weren't you? Yeah, I think I was fortunate because I, my interest in exercise physiology came along at a time that I was really coaching runners uh, in upstate New York. And uh, w when I moved to uh, Ball State, you know, I had to create my own ideas for research. And it just so happened that my, one of my first graduate students was uh, uh, an alternate on the Olympic team in the marathon. And so he knew uh, all the top runners in the world. So when I got him in the laboratory, I thought this is a natural combination. So. It was right at the time, actually before the running boom started. So I happened to be at the right place. So when I started doing research on runners, runners were totally underappreciated. I mean, it, there were probably 200 marathon runners in the United States. So when I started studying them, uh, I was uh, looked upon as uh, a great guru of running when I knew very little, but I learned. I wanted to characterize runners, and that's pretty much how I got started. I wanted to find out why they were so good and I was so bad. So, I mean, the muscle biopsy procedure now is routinely used around the world. I mean, back then it was probably a pretty novel technique. Well, no one in the United States was using it, but I attended a meeting uh, when uh, Bert Russell from Canada uh, had worked with a physician in Canada and had done the biopsy. I think they'd learned it from uh, Bergstrom and Holtman. And so I said, you know, if he can do them, I can do them. So I went to Canada. He, their physician taught me how to do them. Then I went home and taught my physician how to do them. And we started doing biopsies in 1968. And as a consequence, naturally, I used runners. So we started biopsying lots of runners and uh, began, again, looking to find out what was unique and characteristic of these runners, and that's when we were discovering fiber types because we were working with Bank Saltine and Phil Golnick, and uh, we were doing the fiber typing, and so we used the biopsy procedure initially to characterize runners. Of course, one of the early studies was looking at glycogen utilization right. on successive days and, and during different types of events, and, and that really led, together with the work from Bergstrom and Holtman and the glycogen loading studies, that this sort of field of sports nutrition really emerged from some of those early studies, didn't it? Yes, I mentioned to you earlier that there, there was no such field as sports nutrition. Uh, the only thing we really dealt with initially was with fluid balance and problems of dehydration, and then it became obvious that the energy reserves in runners uh, in marathons and long races were characterized by 
kind of a failure of the muscle to be able to generate enough energy. And so if in studying the literature, you know, I went all the way back to uh, Christensen and Hansen 1939 paper where they showed clearly that endurance was enhanced by having uh, large amounts of carbohydrate in the diet. Well, up until that time, we knew carbohydrate was important, but, uh, and we knew glycogen was in muscle, but we really didn't have data to show uh, what happened when the glycogen stores in muscle were depleted. So it was all during that period that we, I'd say the period of the 70s and maybe into the 80s that were uh, the focus years for uh, muscle glycogen. And so all the studies you, you see are, were based on that. And that's where the sports nutrition part fit in because you could bring in manipulation of diet in order to alter the glycogen content and see the, the impact on performance. Of course, the other thing that, uh, that happened as, as the field worked uh, and, and developed, you um, started doing work with single fibers. And of course, that started uh, in an interesting twist with, uh, with Bob Fitz, who'd really oh, yeah. done that. And of course, he was one of your athletes, wasn't he? Well, he was an undergraduate when I was in upstate New York mm -hmm. and had never been a runner. But when he started running uh, for me, uh, <clears throat> he also was taking my phys physiology classes. And subsequently, when he graduated, he, he went on to be a national champion runner. Uh, but in the meantime, he got interested in physiology and got advanced degrees. And then we kept in contact over the years because of our common interest in exercise and, and physiology. But in about 1988 or 89, he, f he learned that I was going to do a study with uh, the swimming team, and, and I wanted to see what happened when you doubled their training, and to see how quickly they would fatigue or adapt. And Bob found out about that, and he was doing the single fiber techniques, which meant taking the biopsies that we'd always taken, but instead of using the whole muscle, he was able, under a dissecting scope, to pull out single fibers and to study the strength, diameter, speed of contraction of those single fibers. And so uh, he and I got together and started doing research on single fibers. Very tedious process, takes a lot of skill, and uh, probably one of the reasons why he became one of the best muscle physiologists in the world. Of course, you've used that technique to look at the effects of space flight and also aging and uh, because the you know the inactivity often associated with aging you know is, is obviously accelerated in a in a weightless um, environment I, I guess those aging studies brought you back to examine some years later some of those early runners didn't they yeah uh, it seemed uh, I have probably qualify everything by saying each of the areas that I've studied has always been something that I'm interested in at the time so when I was running, we studied running. And then I was swimming, so we studied swimming. Now I'm getting old, so we study aging. Yeah. And it, in the aging studies, there are all the atrophy or changes that take place in muscle, the effect of exercise and training in older people. Uh, you know, Scott Trappy and the people who are in the lab now, uh, that's the focus. Uh, we've studied and are studying uh, the astronauts that are on the space station who are weightless for six months at a time. And you, if you look at single muscle fibers, you're getting closer to the mechanisms that uh, cause all the negative effects. But you can also see ways to manipulate the muscle to retain uh, the capacity of muscle to uh, you know, achieve strength, power, and prevent atrophy. And just in closing, I guess you, you're engaged in your own personal experiment, aren't you? Because you're a highly accomplished master swimmer. And you've yeah. been, I remember when I was in the lab, you were really starting on your return to swimming, but you've been now over 30 years in the pool. How, how do you find it from your personal experience? The, how have you noticed you know, the changes in your own physiology and performance as you've kept up your master swimming? over the years? Well, I said the main reason why I studied, did all these studies on each of the activities I was doing was I always wanted to be 
as good as I could be. I mean, I think you're genetically programmed how much you can adapt, how much muscle you can produce. Uh, and so as, as I uh, went along, I learned a lot about myself and how much training was needed, how, how much rest is needed, uh, and now learning what happens when you prepare for competition has all helped me. Uh, and I think aging, uh, I can see, of course, biology wins, or you could say gravity wins. Uh, but the problem is that uh, you can probably maintain a given level. The key, I, uh, the key thing I think now is to have a good muscle mass when you're middle age. Because when you go into older age, if you don't have muscle, it's very hard to produce it. And the studies that have been done with 80 plus year old people who are put into strength training programs show that they don't adapt. I mean, it, they may get a little stronger, but it's not because the fibers get bigger or more powerful. Uh, they just uh, show very small changes. So if you go start your aging process and you've got a lot of muscle, at least you've got a reserve. But if you wait until you're 80, uh, it's going to be really hard. Well, Dave, it's a pleasure having you back here at the University of Melbourne and here in Australia. Next year is the 50th anniversary of the uh, establishment of the Human Performance Laboratory, which has made a significant contribution to exercise physiology over the years and trained many students who have gone on to you know, start their own labs. So thanks very much for uh, visiting the university and for your time this morning. Well, I appreciate it, and uh, thank you for being one of my students. Pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, Dave.